hello everyone uh, welcome to the uh, this distinguished talk on uh, introduction to solar geoengineering we with us we have professor david keith i have met him uh, in, at, during my masters in a summer school you know on solar geoengineering and after th this many years i am seeing him again so he's here he's he's a renowned scientist climate scientist working you know in the interface of climate science uh, policy and and uh, several other things and one of the key area that right now he is working on is uh, solar geoengineering uh, uh, he was he he has a uh, he has experience for 25 years on all this uh, field uh, on this aspects uh, professor keith uh, previously served as the gordon mackay professor of applied physics at the harvard university school of engineering and applied sciences and as a professor of public policy at the harvard kennedy school uh, and right now he has recently joined uh, the university of chicago climate system engineering program uh, it's an initiative basically uh, he is also a founder and board member of carbon uh, carbon engineering a company developing technology for the capture of carbon dioxide from ambient air uh, he strong strongly advocates for the research into climate engineering approaches for addressing climate change so uh, without uh, further uh, you know uh, adu we we welcome professor david keith to uh, deliver his talk uh, yeah thank you um so i'm going to try and give a overview of some i'm oh, sorry pretty that good there so i'll give a overview of a little bit about what solar geoengineering is and how it fits into the different ways we might respond to climate change and try and say a little bit about um, uh, what some of the risks and benefits might be. Uh, I would say just sort of a couple caveats to that introduction. So yes, I think that research on this makes sense, but I think that's very different from saying that uh, it makes sense to deploy these technologies. My view is that we should have a moratorium and not deploy them, but that it's worth knowing much more about them, about how well they would work and what the risks are. Uh, and I think it's also important to distinguish the company that I was involved in works in a very different area of developing uh, technical systems for purifying CO2 from the atmosphere. And that's um, quite different. And, and in fact, uh, it's important to say that I believe there should not be commercial work in uh, solar geoengineering. So don't, it's easy to get confused by that. Um, so I'm going to start by giving you the kind of highest level overview of how I think about the climate problem. I think there are really four fundamental categories of things we can do about climate. And it's in that context that it, it and I think only in that context that it makes sense to think about solar geoengineering. So if you think about this basic causal chain that makes climate change, economic activities make emissions, emissions of CO2 each year, those build up in the atmosphere to make the concentration of CO2. The concentration of CO2 causes the climate change, and the climate change in turn causes the, all the different harms to humans and the natural environment. So if you think about how we manage the climate problem, you basically can break that chain in four places. So decarbonization, decarbonizing the economy, changing the industrial infrastructure of our civilization to eliminate fossil fuels, that is absolutely doable. We're making much more progress than we were a few years ago. Uh, and, and that breaks the link between economic activity and emissions. So there's no question that can be done. It's hard. It's going to cost a lot of money, but it's doable. Um, but as, as many of you know, if you have a background in climate, even if you eliminate emissions, you don't solve the climate problem. All you've done is stop making it worse, because the climate problem is basically proportional to cumulative emissions. So getting to next zero doesn't, doesn't make the problem go away. It just means you, you stop adding to it. So um, carbon removal, by which I mean anything that takes carbon from the atmosphere uh, back to some stable reservoir, is essentially like a time machine. It's allowing us to go back uh, uh, to, to take emissions, take historical emissions out of the atmosphere, if you like. So I'll say a few words about carbon removal. So one way to think about carbon removal is that what, what's caused climate change is, you know, we've moved, fossil fuel burning has moved carbon from the geosphere to the atmosphere. And then it equilibrates with the land biosphere and with the ocean in complicated ways. 
Um, there are a bunch of things we could do that shift uh, uh, carbon from the atmosphere to the land biosphere. So all these ways that we have of, of putting more forests and so on. But those things are inherently short term because there's lots of natural equilibration here. That's not to say it's not useful, but it's inherently short term. There are also ways that we can move uh, carbon back from the atmosphere to more permanent reservoirs. So that would be true with biomass energy with geologic storage or this thing I worked on, direct air capture. Either of those are putting CO2 back into uh, isolated places where it will be isolated for millions of years. So that is really negative emissions. And, and adding alkalinity to the oceans or enhanced rock weathering are also effectively negative emissions and they're, they're permanent on the kind of time scale that matters here. So I think it makes sense to think of those things as negative emissions. I think these other uh, things up here almost need a different name. This is not to say that this is bad and this is good because some of these may cost a lot or have very bad environmental impacts. So uh, in order to make decisions, we have to actually make trade-offs. But I think that we shouldn't count anything here as the same as there because time scale really matters. So if you fly across the Pacific and emit a ton of carbon doing that, no amount of planting trees reduces the long-term risk over thousands of years that your one flight causes. But if you really took the, the, the ton back out of the atmosphere, then that actually has reduced that long-term risk. Make sense? So I think it's useful to at least divide those into two categories. So that's all what um, carbon removal does. So carbon removal is breaking this link between uh, historical emissions and concentrations. So solar geoengineering, it, it but best can weaken the link between concentrations, the amount of CO2, and the amount of climate change. It can't break the link. There's no version of solar geoengineering that is perfectly negative, negative CO2. But there's evidence it could weaken the link substantially. So I'll say a little more about that. So when I say solar geoengineering, I'm thinking of a range of ways by which humans could deliberately intervene in the Earth system to make the Earth, to change the radiative balance of the Earth. Most obviously by making the Earth more reflective, but also for some of them by making it more infrared transmissive so, so uh, uh, heat can get out better. So I think of all these things going from the top in principle, humans could build a big shield in between the Earth and the Sun. There are actually papers about this going back 20 years now, and there's a fair number of research. But over the next half century, I don't think there's any chance at all this gets done in the real world. But over a, a, a century and a half, the kind of time scale of the problem, I think it's not ridiculous to think about it. Um, the thing that we understand the best and are, have some sense the most confidence that could be done, which isn't the same as saying it's a good idea, is putting aerosols in the stratosphere, where they have a lifetime of about two years uh, and they distribute pretty evenly. Uh, um, there's also a set of ideas about um, decreasing high-level cirrus clouds. And those are tightly connected to another set of ideas about altering aircraft trajectories or flight times to reduce the radiative forcing from aircraft. And that's one of the interesting ways in which thinking about de deliberately um, manipulating the radiative forcing is going to kind of move into public policy. So right now, mostly these ideas of solar geoengineering are taboo. We focus on managing emissions. But if we start managing aircraft tracks to manage uh, contrails, which the aircraft industry is getting quite serious about, then that's one place where we're actually starting to directly manage radiative forcing uh, as opposed to managing uh, emissions. Then there's ideas about adding to um, sea salt aerosols, uh, cloud condensation nuclei to low level clouds to make them wider, marine boundary layer clouds. And there's also a set of ideas about actually making the surface uh, uh, whiter. So those are all the things that, that to me are solar climate intervention or solar geoengineering. People argue about these names. Um, so all of these things can uh, uh, weaken the link between concentrations and climate change. So it could reduce the amount of climate change for a given amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. And then adaptation is something that can weaken the link between climate change and, and human or environmental damages. So I think it's important to think about that. And I think in policy terms, we need to think in four dimensions, which doesn't necessarily mean we have to do them all, but I think uh, you have to consider them all. And so <clears throat> now I want to say a little bit about how those first three might fit together over time. So I'll do this first in a version that has no um, units, but I actually can show you, if you like, in questions, uh, integrate assessment model that does this with actual numbers. But the important thing is to think about what's the order that we use these things, how to, how to use them. So if you just did fossil fuels forever, then concentrations keep growing 
and the Earth keeps getting hotter, you know, to disaster. If you cut emissions to zero, uh, uh, you know that you basically bring the problem back to uh, equilibrium, but it doesn't really get better. If you remove carbon, you could gradually reduce the thing going back to pre-industrial, if you like. If we ever actually got to net zero and we're starting to remove carbon, then it's a human choice how far back we want to go. Are we heading back to pre-industrial or to some other point in between where we stopped in pre-industrial? That's a choice. Um, I think in general, there's a lot, I should say, there's a lot of excitement about carbon removal now, a lot of talk in the academic literature. My view is that if you take the total amount of effort on cutting emissions right now, on net emissions, 95% of that effort should go to cutting emissions. I don't think it makes a lot of sense to spend a lot of effort removing carbon from the atmosphere now when we're still putting a lot of carbon in. Like, you know, you should focus first on reducing the carbon that goes in. My view is that in terms of timing, it mostly will make sense to do carbon removal after we've cut emissions by a lot. Like by the time we're like two thirds of the way back towards zero emissions, that's when it might make sense to really do more carbon removal at scale. So whatever we do for, um, for emissions and carbon removal, we'll have some curve for the CO2 concentration, which is more or less the same as the climate risk. And that curve has a point that's a peak. So then you think about how would you use solar geoengineering? There's no single right answer, but I think there's some ways to think about better and worse answers. And my view is that the sensible answer is to use it to cut the top off the curve, not to hold it in one place forever. You could also imagine waiting until the curve got to some point and then suddenly cooling down. That's what a lot of simulations do. I think that very likely doesn't make sense because you don't want the world to suddenly cool down. So in this thing, you're gradually increasing, the amount of solar geoengineering is the difference between those curves, so you're gradually increasing it. And then once concentrations are at the peak, you're gradually decreasing it after that. So it's a temporary thing you do to reduce the peak. Yep. So, uh, I guess you don't mind questions. Oh, I, I want questions, yes. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Carbons, yeah. And you use decarbonization and uh, reducing, you said 95% of the effort should be removing emissions. Yeah. Are you distinguishing No, I'm using those synonymously, so I'm being, yeah, yeah. I mean, decarbonization is a different paradigm. Need, yeah, I'm not sure. Anyway, I'm using them together. To, to me, I mean just reducing the net emissions from industrial act society by, which, I guess you could do it by decreasing energy use, but I think mostly we'll do it by switching from high carbon energy to low carbon energy. Solar, wind, whatever. Maybe I'm missing your point, I'm not sure. Um, yeah. And the idea of reducing emissions is led to these negotiations which after 25 years we have not bent the curve. So I actually, so what you just said, I think, was true five years ago. I don't think it's true anymore. So what he said was that, you know, we've had 25 years of talk and we haven't bent the curve. And I feel like I've said the same thing you've said, but I think it's less true now. So we are now spending over 1% of the total economy of the world on low carbon energy on wind, solar, and batteries, over 1.1 trillion a year now. And, and if you look at that as a fraction of the total flow of all human activity into long-lived capital stock, it's getting to be about a fifth. That's not small. And if you look at the total primary energy from wind and solar, where for years they were, you could almost ignore them, they're now actually beginning to take a dent into total primary. So my guess is we're about at peak emissions now. It'd be pretty hard to go up from here. So. I think if you just look at the emissions curve, I think you're still right this year. But if you look at what we know is the derivative that drives the emissions curve, because remember, emissions are instantaneously due to the capital stock in the ground at one point, all the human hardware that makes stuff. To solve the climate problem with emissions, we need to replace the capital stock. You do that incrementally. And if you look at the capital stock, you can see it's changing now. So I, I think in a sense that feels different. It feels like we're making progress now. Uh, yep. What about the token energy demand? That is also increasing quite rapidly. I mean, yep. we're considering the scope of uh, yep. increasing energy demand and increasing green energy. Yep. I mean, probably the increasing energy demand has a much higher scope. So in that sense... You're saying that the total demand is increasing faster than green energy? Yeah, I don't think demand. that's true anymore. I mean, 
that no, I think that was true. I think this is this is where I would have given that lecture ten years ago. Look at the numbers last year. If you look, and I'm not being fooled, I'm not being stupid at using capacity. If you look at actual generation, I think that is maybe still true this year, but it won't be true next year. Yeah, I think I think we're. Yeah, it's really a different world. Yeah. In general, total energy is still we, we, Correct. So for, for electricity, it's definitely true that the additional is now. For, for primary, it's right at the tipping edge this year or next year. Oh, we're still building a herge amount. I'm not saying primary is going down. The point I'm making, which feel free to disagree with, is that for years I could give talks to say, oh, politicians fly around and talk about climate, but nothing's happening. And I think in a world where you're spending 1% of GDP on clean energy and you can see rapid increases in net generation, I don't think that's nothing happening anymore. I think it's real. So um, that's a summary of, of how I think about using these things over time. And, and now I want to give more details about solar geoengineering. So I'm going to give a bunch of uh, examples of how it might work and, and suggest some ways in which I think it might work surprisingly well. Because while there's a great deal of sensible reasons to be concerned about solar geoengineering, and many people who think we shouldn't even research it, I think there's actually now a lot of data that suggests it could be quite profoundly useful in reducing um, human impacts of climate change and environmental impacts. But there also are a set of risks and policy concerns. So I, before I talk about the details, I want to share some uh, structure about what these risks and concerns are as I see them. Everybody obviously sees them differently. So um, oh, there we go. All right. So this is from a, a, a paper that I wrote uh, towards constructive disagreement. I was trying to get to constructive disagreement. Um, and it it's, looks a little messy here, but it's actually a taxonomy. So the top level of taxonomy is physical risks of benevolent deployment. This is where... We have attempted to do this in a, in a useful way. So imagine there's some committee with some coalition of nations that actually wants to do this, where the committee is charged with reducing the risks. So even if the goal is to reduce risk, we know that sometimes engineers have a goal of reducing risks and stuff goes wrong. So there's uh, side effects, which we talked a lot about, but as well as side effects, there's accidents or incompetence. Those are all things that really happen uh, in any engineered system. Uh, so these are all the physical risks of benevolent deployment. And we'll talk a bunch more about those. Um, and this isn't all of them. This is just a structured list of them. Then there's a set of justice concerns that I think underlie a lot of the reason why people don't want to talk about this. The central thing that most people are worried about is what's called moral hazard here. The idea that even talking about these technologies will reduce the pressure to cut emissions. Or put another way, I think the correct word is it's a fear of political exploitation. And I think that fear is reasonable. So um, uh, companies or countries that um, want to block decarbonization, so like big fossil companies or countries, will, ex will exaggerate how well solar geoengineering works politically in order to try and reduce the, the emissions cuts. I think that is a reasonable fear. So that's what I've got here. Um, where am I here? Um, uh, and then there's a kind of collective addiction problem. Then there's some, some justice concerns. So there's a procedural justice concern, which is who gets to decide? Which country? Which de deliberate people? How do you do it? Then there's a distributive justice concern, which is wh whoever decides, there's going to be some winners and losers. Those winners and losers are distributed. Then there's a, a, a third high-level category, which is conflict. It could evolve various ways. And then there's some issues about kind of interaction of humanity and the environment that I think are important. So there's a whole bunch of like, legitimate concerns. Um, I want to get those out on the table. Now I want to say a little bit about how effectively it could reduce risks. So remember, the amount of solar geoengineering is a policy choice. It's not something we're studying. And you get a lot of solar geoengineering papers that kind of just make some assumption, like we're going to use solar geoengineering to reduce temperatures back to pre-industrial. And then they analyze the consequence of that and have conclusions that say geoengineering does X. But that conclusion can't be right. The conclusion is, if you assume this, then that. Solar geoengineering is a policy choice, 
So any statement about it has to say, if this, then that. And so one way to think about it is since we have a choice of how much to do, you could say what really matters is the ratio of benefits to harms. There are other things that matters, but that's one of the most important things. What is the ratio of benefits to harms? And that's what I'll get at in the next set of slides. So I said it depends. What dimensions does it depend on? There's a thousand little things, but I think there's three big things, at least for, for most kinds of geoengineering. It depends on how much SRM is used, on what method is used, is it, is it marine cloud brightening or stratospheric aerosols? And it depends on the spatial distribution of radio forcing. Are you doing all on one hemisphere or all over India or globally over the whole world? So those choices determine a lot about what the results are. Here, here in red, finally, are some specific choices I'm making, which I think, and many other people think, are pretty reasonable choices that might actually be useful. So stratospheric sulfates, go for roughly uniform, balance the, the uh, north and southern hemisphere, and um, assume that you want to do partial cooling, that you're using this to reduce climate change, but you're not using it instead of cutting emissions. That's a key, that's a, a judgment, but it's, it matters. Okay, so in that situation, what happens? So I'll first show you results from a high resolution model that we did with uh, GFDL, Geophysical Fluid Dynamics Lab, where we used uh, a model that is a quarter degree resolution model. And the reason they'll use these high resolution models is that they do a substantially better job on precipitation variability and also temperature variability. That doesn't mean they're perfect, but as somebody who's been involved in climate modeling for 30 years, I'm actually kind of impressed by how well modern models do stuff that old models really couldn't. So this shows you uh, how well these models, uh, this model reproduces the um, hurricane distribution, and this is the, uh, in, in the, the black is observations, and the red is the high floor distribution of max wind speed. And I think it's pretty amazing that models can get that roughly right now. And to be clear, there's not a little hurricane Fortran module in there. The, the model physics is just making these things happen, which was not true when I started climate modeling. It's really quite exciting, and it really shows there's some skill in these models. Um, so what we did is we're basically comparing a world with, um, you feel like we're looking at three things, the pre-industrial, a world with double CO2, and a world where we've done enough solar geoengineering to take us halfway back to pre-industrial, so to cut off half the temperature rise. And we're looking at what the results are. So you can look at it as like a distribution over the Earth's surface. So for example, if you're looking at surface air temperature, if this is the uh, surface air temperature anomaly compared to pre-industrial, and this is the world with 2x CO2. This is the distribution over the land surface. So there's a median, but there's a tail out to 4.5 degrees. So that's the hottest grid boxes. If you do the half solar geo, you shift the mean, but you also compress the tail a lot. Like, so notice here, you've cut the mean about in half, but you've uh, cut the uh, extremes a little more than half. And that's pretty common. Solar geoengineering tends to damp the extremes even more than it damps the means. Uh, and that's especially true, as you'll see, for tropical cyclones, where when you cool the world halfway back to pre-industrial uh, uh, for temperature, you actually bring the tropical cyclone energies all the way back to pre-industrial. It's quite a, a shocking result. Um, so now I'll say a little more about it. We looked at um, four main variables, and the variables we're looking at are temperature, T, te extreme temperature, hottest hour of the year, P minus C, precip minus evaporation, which is basically water availability. It says something about soil moisture, water availability, runoff. And then extreme precipitation, which in our case for accounting is the, the wettest five days, the five days with the biggest precip in a year. So if you think about how those map onto climate hazards, many climate hazards are driven by temperature, but even more by extreme temperature. P minus C is really about water availability and droughts. And um, PX is really about uh, storm damage, storm flooding. So those are the variables we looked at. And then for each of these IPCC standard uh, SREX regions, we're um, color coding things according to whether they moved you um, uh, uh, closer back towards pre-industrial or exacerbated mean you moved it farther from pre-industrial. And then we're color coding for statistical significance. So the result is pretty shocking and it feels to me even every time I show this, like it must be a trick and we must have tuned the model to produce this because 
you'll see there's not a single symbol in any of the locations that's red. So for every box, we looked at four variables, and none of them have statistically significant exacerbation. That is a really shocking outcome. So I don't believe it's necessarily true. But I used to, I wrote a book, I've given lots of talks saying solar geoengineering, yes, it can reduce global average temperatures, but it will certainly make some places a lot worse off. Well, I don't think that's necessarily true anymore, because this, this model does not find that it makes any place worse off. It basically is either moderating or not doing anything statistically significant, all the variables in all the locations. That is really an impressive result. It may not be true. It may be a flaw in the model. It may be something about the way we set the model up. Different models produce slightly different answers. Uh, of course, all this depends on these assumptions about the fact that we chose pretty uniform geoengineering. Um, and with different assumptions, you can produce a very different answer. So if you just did one hemisphere, you get a very different answer with lots of places that are made uh, exacerbated. Uh, but I think if you have a single graph, or there's some other versions of this graph, that that is an argument that this might actually be something to take seriously, that actually could reduce risks a lot, this is the plot. Because this is really saying that there's, at least according to this particular model, but lots of other models get basically the same kind of answer, you could really reduce many aspects of climate change globally. And what I haven't said yet is to be clear, doing this is relatively cheap and easy. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. So just to understand the background, you're putting stuff still in the stratosphere and in this model we're just adjusting the solar constant. But I've got another version that did it with stuff in the stratosphere, yeah. Yeah, I guess, I mean, internal variability is the variability, but there's then the actual response you're seeing on top of the variability. Yeah, I mean, it's coming yeah. from, I mean, you're not changing anything else. No. Yeah. yeah. So yes, this does not have a response of biosphere. This does have the stomatal resistance response, but not, the, but not a feedback through greenhouse gases. The greenhouse gases are fixed in this version. There's a, many different versions of this we're doing, but yeah. So, but, but the answer to your, what you're saying, so we try to avoid cherry picking one way or the other. So these regions are standard regions the IPCC had used a lot. So we didn't choose them. Of course you're right that this doesn't prove that it might be that all the rain is here and not here and India got much worse off. Absolutely true. There are a bunch of other things that have looked at this, but we didn't do that in this analysis. So, um, so this is... This now is a summary of what I showed you one model result. This is a summary of a bunch of model results, a kind of high-level summary of some of what we see. And I think I'm going to come back to it and not say too much here, because I'm going to say some of this mortality stuff in detail somewhere else. But, but to talk about some of the benefits of cooling kind of from 2 to 5, 2.5 to 1.5, um, there's this redu reduction in, in, in heat mortality, which I'll talk about in a minute. Uh, I should say there's now quite a few papers that have looked at agricultural yields under solar geoengineering, and they generally show that, that the yields go up, uh, not for every crop in every place, but in general significantly. Um, there's the tropical cyclone thing I mentioned about, sea level rise. But I think I realize I'm, I'm not going to go through this in detail now. I just wanted to give you a sense there's quite a lot here, um, but also there's a bunch of risks. What I want to do is focus on, on these ones in red and now actually talk about the uh, risk to risk. But again, I'm putting now the same slide I said before. I want to remind you, all of this depends on assumptions. So if some other person comes here and gives a lecture and says, solar geoengineering will produce giant droughts over India, you can't say that they're wrong or that I'm right or vice versa unless you decide what's the scenario. And that scenario, you folks, especially you young folks, own more than anybody else. Like no scientist knows the scenario. This is a policy choice. It's a choice people will make. Uh, uh, and if, if people did decide to do this all in one hemisphere, for example, you could easily uh, completely disrupt the Indian monsoon, for example. So 
Now I want to do this risk-risk comparison, which I promised at the beginning. So if you were going to do, uh, again, sulfur injection to cool the world one degree C, and to be clear, I'm not actually saying that you just suddenly start and cool the world one degree C. I think that would be crazy, It'd be destructive and dangerous. Uh, to me, if we ever did this, what you'd do is you'd start very gradually, monitor on the way up, you gradually increase the radiative forcing from solar geoengineering, and, and do that as concentrations were still going up, and then to the place where concentrations peaked, you'd then reduce it, as I showed you, and maybe at the peak, you'd be reducing temperatures from what they would have been 2.5 down to 1.5, let's say. So that's, that's what I'm thinking of. Don't think of an instantaneous cooling. So um, then you can start to look at what some of the risks are. You know, the risk is this might change the way the sky looks. It might kill people from air pollution because you're putting a polluted, pollutant in the atmosphere. It might damage the ozone layer. And here are some of the potential benefits. So what I'm going to do is just look at those two, or those three rather, and make a quantitative comparison, which is the first time that we're able to do this really. We've now got enough data from enough papers to start to do it, which I think is the most important kind of underlying technical question in this topic. So I'm going to first take the the damages. Um, so you've got to figure out if you're adding sulfur to the atmosphere, you've got to worry about air pollution since we know that putting sulfur in the atmosphere now is killing many millions of people a year globally from air pollution. So obviously if we're talking about doing it, we've got to think about air pollution. And you also need to think about the ozone loss. So I won't go through this in much detail, but I want to say actually a little bit about who the experimenters were and why we did this. Because if you just show these things, if you're like me, I'm always skeptical. People can always tune their models, or maybe their models are just there to tell a story. So it's important to say kind of how we got there. So this collaboration that did this paper was really built around a guy called Steve Barrett, who's a professor. He's the, actually now the chair of MIT Aero Astro. He's done, his main career has been looking at the atmospheric effects of aviation. So he had a whole set of chemical models and also um, air quality impact models to measure what happened for stratospheric, for uh, sulfur injection at about 10 kilometer altitude. And I thought, he's the best person in the world to go just inject the sulfur a little higher and actually look at the health impacts using the GeoSCAM model is what we did. And so we did that in a probabilistic way and that was also coupled to the health impacts, air pollution health impacts. And I think I won't go through the, the model except to say it was that what originally we thought about was just focusing on the fact that if you put the sulfate in, that's going to make more particulate matter on the ground. That's the obvious thing. That turned out to be actually small and unimportant. The bigger effects are all the indirect effects. Um, so I'm just going to jump to the answer. The paper, by the way, does this with probability, looks at a whole bunch of different things. Uh, and the paper actually has error bars, which I'm not putting in here. But if you add those two numbers up, you're at about an increase in mortality between those two causes of 10,000 people a year. That's not nothing. That's saying if you put this sulfur in a stratosphere, that'd be a million tons, million and a half tons of sulfur in a stratosphere. You'd be increasing the number of people dying in the world by 10,000 people. It's a lot. So then you can look at the benefits. So we're doing this with um, uh, using these new state-of-the-art uh, estimates of uh, how um, temperature changes mortality. So what you find is that any given city, and as it happens, I've been using this slide for a while. Mumbai was one of the two cities that I chose when we made the slide, and now I'm giving this talk here, which is kind of fun. So the way this works is that every city, we, uh, not me, but uh, uh, in this case, my colleague, Michael Greenstone, um, we have daily data on mortality, say in Mumbai, how many people die each day in Mumbai. And we have the temperature data, and you're doing a kind of correlation that looks at how death rates uh, uh, change. And then you're trying to remove what's called harvesting and a bunch of other effects and basically make a polynomial fit. And in the end, what you see is, and there's humidity too, but we're not going to ignore that for now, that, that as the days get over 35, the death rate really goes up in Mumbai. And also, as the days get below 15, it goes up by not very much. And in Boston, you see a different effect. It's always a U-shape, but in Boston, the actual peak is, is in the cold temperatures, where you really get a lot more deaths in Boston. Um, so in that sense, if you just make Boston a little bit warmer, you expect the uh, death rate to go down in these models. Does that make sense? So these are, pardon? There's a total deaths, all-cause mortality. Um, um, and it's actually age stratified and then income adjusted, and there's a whole bunch of, it's a lot under the hood here. Um, we're just using this, um, uh, we're using this Carlton et al., which is kind of the state of the art paper on heat, heat mortality. Um, and then we're using more or less the same client model, I won't go into it. 
And uh, we're combining the epidemiological model and the climate model to make a map of how these all-cause mortality changes. So this is a map of the world that's showing you the change in risk when you do solar geoengineering, the change in deaths uh, per 100,000 per year for a one degree C change. And so what you basically see to first order, you've got a zonal plot there, is that in the hot regions here in the tropics, you've reduced deaths quite a lot. And in the really cold regions, you've increased them. But this isn't weighted by the number of people. So I have actually loved the Arctic and I've traveled up here, but there's 50,000 people that live in that whole area. So not to say they're not important, but it's a lot less than live in just a neighborhood in Mumbai. So this map here is doing it by number of people per square kilometer. So in this map, you don't see any color really up here because there's no people. And you see it dominated by India where you get a big reduction in mortality. Um, so you can add up the numbers. And the, the net effect in this particular version of the model is we reduce the population weighted mortality by 13 per 100,000. That may not mean, mean, not mean much to you, but you know that people live about 100 years. So the mortality per 100,000 per year has to be about 1,000 for, the, for pe that to come out right. In fact, it's 800. This is awkward. What yeah. Is uncertainty and uncertainty? Pardon? Estimates of uncertainty associated with it. Uh, for, for the mortality side? Yes. Um, um, so in the paper, we're propagating uncertainty all the way through from the uncertainty in the model, and we do it different ways. Um, I'd say if you just look at that and include the uncertainty from, if you look at the uncertainty in this number, yes. and you do that in the different ways we treat adaptation in the paper, the uncertainty is probably about a factor of two round numbers if you look at the full spread in the paper. I can actually pull up a figure pretty easily. We're just finishing this now. Um, so, so, again, now for getting uncertainty, I just want to do the calculations. If you multiply this back by the number of people to calculate what that is, that's a million people a year. So in the net, you've reduced mortality by a million people a year. So now you can compare the two, and the ratio is 100 to 1. So I am not saying that that means geoengineering necessarily has benefits 100 times bigger than harms. For one thing, I only looked at these particular benefits and harms, and I only did it with one model. But I am saying this is starting to be meaningful because, well, well, we only look at these, these uh, impacts. These are not unimportant impacts. The heat-related mortality is the biggest single impact of climate change when you monetize climate impacts. And air pollution and ozone are some of the most, either the most talked about or most obvious impacts of putting stratospheric aerosols in. So these are not trivial impacts. And they show that the benefits might be a lot bigger than the harms. To be clear, do I believe the number is 100 to 1? No, the error bars are big here. But uh, the way we actually write it in this paper is much more carefully. We say that the evidence is strong that the uh, benefits are bigger than the harms. We're very conservative in the way we say it. Yeah. Um, this is done with uh, two times CO2 going halfway, going all the way back in that paper, actually. Um, so. So let me stop there. Any questions? I've got, I want, I'll want. i throw in a few more slides, but that's the, that's the sort of core recent climate model results on solar geoengineering that I wanted to show. So feel free to ask any questions. I know some of you may be like, what the heck is solar geoengineering, or how would we do it? So feel free to ask some questions, then I'll put a little more in. Yep? Yep. So those are great questions. My first answer is they're questions that like you'd be better to answer than me because they're questions that I'm the old generation. Your generation will make those decisions. That's obviously not a scientific question. It's a question of what's the right goals for people to pursue. I think one thing I can say that is scientific is there's a huge distinction in the time scale between carbon removal or emissions cuts and solar geoengineering. So solar geoengineering is inherently short term. 
You can look at that as good or bad, but it's a fact. So if you do solar geoengineering in the near term, you get these benefits and risks, but you get them quickly. And if you stop it, they go away quickly. With either, if you either don't emit a ton of carbon, or if you took a ton of carbon out of the air, you really have a benefit that goes thousands of years in the future. And so, in my view, both those goals are relevant. So there's no simple answer. I care about people in 100 years, and I also care about people now. And it's not obvious how to weight the two. Whose scenario? Oh, on how to actually do it? Frighteningly little. So there's been a sort of taboo against research on this topic. The, as these ideas, I should say, are old. So I've worked on a bunch of these ideas starting 30 years ago, but I was not the first at all. There were papers back into the 60s on this idea. Basically, these ideas came as soon as the modern idea of climate change came. But there has been really little work on the practical details. So in the last couple of years, for example, the question of like, which aircraft would you use? How would you modify the aircraft? So me and a few friends, most of all a guy called Wake Smith, have really worked to actually work on aircraft design. He's an ex-Boeing guy. He's got some Boeing engineers working on aircraft design. But that's still in a very academic way. It's not serious. Um, on the other hand, it's not very hard. We've talked to a bunch of aircraft designers. It's clear if you give them the billions of bucks, they could do it fast. So it's not clear it's a real problem, but it, it's an interesting problem. So the answer to the question of how how much details about how to do it, mostly it hasn't been thought out. Some more questions? Okay, I'm going to give one more slide. I assume I'll get more questions. But I want to give another slide that gives a sense of what's not in models and the kind of thing that we're not accounting for. So I just gave you a bunch of model results, uh, but there's lots of stuff that we don't get right in models. So I'll show you one physical uh, sequence that, that um, we know is not in models. Let me ask one yep. So moral hazard is, of course, a thing that dangles on our heads. So well, it's a thing that dangles on some of our heads in different ways. It's one of many things, yeah. Uh, in the sense of uh, continued uh, ocean acidification and other sources. But there are uh, potentially Benefits, let's say. Yeah. If you reduce mortality over India, there could be additional benefits for cardiovascular disease. Yeah. Just a 30% better lifestyle change. Yep. Because you're looking at total deaths, and, costs, so, uh, and then there's economic growth because high temperatures reduce economic growth. So, yeah. 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 So, but still, it's the scale stuff still kind of must be addressed. Yep. So in the sense of where actually, how the temperature change is, you are, I mean, at your scale, uh, you are involving continental scale temperature. Well, no, no, that model is a quarter degree model. It's a state of the art okay. model. So the it's. Temperature scale is low. Uh, you know, the precipitation yeah. scale is quite low and temperature scale is yeah. at subcontinent level. So then. Yeah. Precipitation skill for getting current precip on those models is, is the glass half full or half empty. It's a lot better than it was 20 years ago. Okay. Yeah. But there are, I'm saying there are also probably cascades into agriculture. For sure, for sure, yep, yep. Agreed. Um, all I was saying, moral hazards, I think, actually not the right word. I think I was the one who introduced that word into this topic. I think I was the first paper to actually use it about this topic, yeah. Oh, yeah, 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 of course. But I'm saying I think I was wrong. It's not the right word, because moral hazard is, is like, it, it refers to the idea that somebody else carries the risk. But it's not clear who the somebody else is in this context. If the moral hazard if you think of the world as one thing, and 
that solar geoengineering means that we put more CO2 in the atmosphere, it's the same we. There's not another group out there. I'm thinking it's more in terms of exposing more That's right. But the point is that decision comes from the CO2, not the, the solar geo. Anyway, I agree. Let me go back to this one other thing I wanted to show you. Um, so, so here's just an example that's more technical of, of stuff that we leave out. So in the, um, in the tropics, uh, these big deep convective clouds, the clouds that go right up to the, the top of the troposphere, they're the ones that if you like hold up the troposphere, these clouds, when the air flows out of them, it's been scrubbed of almost all particulates. There's almost no particles in the air. And, and what happens is particles are formed from organics to make secondary organic or aerosols that are, that, are, uh, it, that are from organic oxidation in the atmosphere. I think that was something we sort of half knew 20 years ago, but we now know it really well. And so in the tropics, the organics that are coming down, the aerosols that are coming down to make uh, uh, aerosols in the sea surface, which then you need for cloud condensation nuclei to make the, the clouds whiter, those aerosols are mostly made in the upper tropical area. So what happens if you have solar geoengineering in the stratosphere and the stratosphere is dropping large particles into the upper troposphere? How does it change things? So your first thought would be, oh, that would just add some particles. So your first thought is, if I'm adding particles here, that's got to increase the number of particles that are coming here. So if I increase the number of particles coming here, the cloud will get whiter. Because if I have some particles here and I add some more, I should have even more. That's wrong. So this making of all these ultrafine particles depends on the fact that the air has been scrubbed of all existing particles. Because that's how you get the supersaturation that allows the homogeneous nucleation to make new particles. If you seed the air with a bunch of existing big particles, then most of that condensing gas goes on the big particles. You reduce the supersaturation so you don't make as many new particles. So in a world where you actually uh, have a, a big flux of big aerosols coming in here, you have less homogeneous nucleation. That means you're making less aerosols. Less aerosols means you've got less cloud condensation nuclei. That means the clouds at the bottom should be getting darker. So we don't know how big that effect is. It's not well modeled in any current model. And it could be big enough that it could actually mean you put sulfates in the stratosphere and the Earth gets darker. The opposite effect that you thought. I don't think it's likely that big, but I just want to emphasize there's a lot we don't know here. A lot that's researchable that we could know that we don't know because there hasn't been serious research effort to understand it. Pardon? The model indirect effect. Indirect effect. Yes, in, in, in that GFDL model, yes. I mean, there's a bunch of different models that have been used here, yeah. But those models still don't have the chemistry to capture this uh, secondary organics in a meaningful way. So, happy to take more questions. I've given you, I, what, the point there was to give you a sense of, of, of what some of the big uncertainties are. There's lots more. I can give you details of what a research program would look like. But I think I want to get a sense of what the questions are more. Now is the time for the uh, students to ask. Yeah, I would like to. Yeah. So, uh, I just want to know, not the question, but the process. I mean, uh, I'm the what? I mean, I, I just want to know the spatial distribution of how you do uh, solar geoengineering. I mean, is it uh, like how is spatially distributed the process within continents across the globe? Um, so that's a choice. And, and, um, um, so most of what I was, so I'm not doing solar geoengineering. So, so I can just like, ask me your question again. I mean, uh, for example, if I have to uh, remove the greenhouse emission effects from, from the globe, yeah. so I have to do solar geoengineering in different parts of the globe. So if I uh, try to do it in India, for example, so what will be its effects on different parts of the yeah, yeah. and how exactly you do it? What's the spatial distribution of going to process? So, so, um, so let's, first of all, if you're just going to take generic solar geoengineering, so let's say I had some magic way 
that I could turn down the sun at any point in the Earth. I say I have some like orbiting low Earth satellites that can, I can adjust their angle. This is silly, but let's say I could do that. So I can turn down the, the sunlight anywhere I want. So the first important thing to say is that even if I can turn down the sunlight in just one place, I, I, I can't control the climate in just that one place because climate is all interconnected flows of heat and momentum. To be clear, the, the, the govern political problem would be easy. If each place could control their own climate, then they wouldn't need to fight about it. Everybody has their own thermostat. They do what they want. That's not the way it's going to work. So for sure, even if you can control the sunlight in just one place, there will be teleconnections. There will be effects in the next place. Uh, I think that's a statement. In general, if you ask for a given total amount of average radiative forcing, uh, or more or less the same as the total amount of cooling, but not quite the same, for a given amount of total average cooling, in general, I think if, it, if you do it more evenly, you're going to have fewer areas where climate change is exacerbated, fewer areas where things are made worse off. You're going to have, it's going to be less lumpy. Whereas if you do all that cooling in just a few areas, you're going to tend to have big changes somewhere else. So with marine cloud brightening, for example, it conventionally only works in certain kinds of boundary air clouds that only cover maybe 10% of the planet. So if you want to do 3 watts per square meter, you've got to do 30 watts per square meter over that 10% of the planet. And that's going to produce some pretty significant local or even large-scale climate changes. Um, but there's no right answer. But in general, my sense is if, what, if the goal, which I think it should be, if the goal is to try and reduce risk in a way that uh, um, does the least harm to any group, then I think you probably want to do it pretty evenly, certainly hemispherically balanced and pretty even. But that may not be what happens. And then if you're asking for stratospheric aerosols, how you do that, the answer is you could do it from two air bases, one at about 30 degrees north and one at about 30 degrees south or 25 degrees. All you need is two. And from there, you can get even distribution east to west, north to south. So you're suggesting that we should stick on to more the process of that actually uh, through solar geoengineering in, in a more distributed way, in a, in a even way? I think so, yes. But lots of other people don't think so. Ma mainly what I think is we should do a lot of research and ask these questions to understand better how all this would work and what the risks are. More questions? Yeah? How do you measure like, what are the beneficial impacts like, of solar geoengineering? Like, like, the main aim of solar geoengineering is like changing. I think the main aim is reducing risks of climate change. You mean how would you prove that it was working? It wouldn't be easy, especially if you're doing it in a way where you're ramping it up slowly. It's very hard to even detect any large-scale effect for decades. Um, so that's a complicated question. And, and you have the problem, you only have one world, so you don't have the counterfactual. And a lot of things are changing at once. So you don't know for sure what part of an effect you're seeing is due to solar geoengineering. You might say, oh, that means we can't possibly do it, because we couldn't do any policy where we couldn't attribute effects. But the reality is governments all the time make major policies that have complicated, uncertain effects that we can't attribute well. That's just the way policy making is. Pardon? Well, not necessarily. That's a choice. Uh, um, uh, uh, but, but I think it's important to say, well, two things. One is you're sort of implying that it was about temperature. I don't think that is the goal. I think the goal is to reduce climate risks. And in fact, as you heard me say, like tropical cyclones, I don't, shouldn't need to tell you here, are significant risks. And, and the fact that this is really drops tropical cyclone intensity overall would be a benefit. And it drops extreme events um, uh, uh, more than it does temperature. So, so to me, that's pretty significant benefit. And sea level rise is also a big one. And you want to increase agricultural productivity. Um, so those are some benefits. Um, but 
But the question about detectability is really a tough one. And it would be easy to detect geo engineering if you turned it on very suddenly, but that's probably the, not the right way to do it. So some of the ways that would make it easiest to detect it would be most destructive. So if, if you said to me, I was just a, a pure scientist, I didn't care about impacts on people, and I need to design geoengineering so I could best attribute it, I'd say, oh, well, you turn it on really, really strongly for like 10 years, then turn it off, and then turn it on, and then turn it off like a sawtooth pattern. That'd be the best way to actually measure what was happening. But obviously, that would be crazy and destructive. So that's so there's a, a sort of a, a um, contradiction between what you'd use to most confidently attribute and what you'd use to have the least impact. Any more questions or opinions? Feel free to say this is crazy or we should do it tomorrow. Yeah? Precip is hard. Oh, yes, I mean, well, for sure, anything you do, if, if, if you, if it's really basic, that if you reduce the sunlight input, you reduce the um, energy imbalance at the surface, so you reduce the energy has to leave the surface, and if the ratio of latent to, to sensible heat stays the same, then you must reduce precip, for sure. That's, that's true by almost, almost any method. We, we actually do have a paper where we show, in principle, you can do solar geoengineering in a way that keeps both temperature and precip the same. It is actually technically possible. People have written that it's not, but it is. But to do that, you have to be spectrally selective. So you actually have to do the solar geoengineering in just some regions of the spectrum where there's a lot of absorption in the middle troposphere. And then you actually can balance both temperature and precip. But, pardon? You could do it regionally. Yeah, yeah, for sure. But I think it's, I don't know of any physically cheap way to do this. You need a very cheap absorber with a narrow bandwidth. It's, it's not, it's a cool paper, but I don't think it's realistic. More questions or comments? Yep. Yeah. Yes, of course I've heard of it, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah I know about it. Well, that's about... Um, I'm not sure I understand the question. I mean, so I know about Lake Niles. I used to work a lot on CCS, and I, of course, lectured about Lake Niles, and I've read papers about it. But you're talking about actually, like, pre preventing Lake Niles from doing it again? I'm not an expert. People have looked at that. There's people who worked on stabilizing Lake Niles. I'm not an expert. I don't know. But that has nothing to do with solar geoengineering. Nah, the total amount of CO2 from Lake Niles is irrelevant to warming. It's just that it was a lot right in one place and it killed people. But it's not a global warming significance. More questions? Yeah? Uh, taking on point of uh, aerosols and PCC and activities, um, so it shows up like gravity having an effect on the hydrological cycle. Would that effect be significant? For sure, because you're bringing the hydrological cycle back towards pre-industrial, yes. Yeah, I mean, statistically significant, yeah, in, in the sense that what I showed was, was all those blue places for P minus E were where we were, the hydrological system was getting closer to pre-industrial statistically significantly, and, and precip was as well, and, and the, the extreme precip, yes, absolutely. I think, let me say one general thing. So, on the one hand, I think it's sensible for people to be concerned about introducing new high-risk technologies. I agree. But I think it's also important to say that there's a risk-to-risk -risk dimension here. And we have to not have our prejudice blindness, because the risk comes from the CO2 in the air. And, and you have to say, what evidence do we have that a world with CO2 in the air, if you compare a world with CO2 to a world with CO2 and some solar geoengineering, which world is more risky? 
I don't think we know the answer, but that's the right question. We're not starting from a risk-free world here. And, and the, the, the right question is to compare those two. And I think that um, we need to be cautious about, uh, cautious about being overcautious. So one way to get at this is to think about how you'd feel differently about this if the CO2 was not due to human action. So imagine a world where we never used fossil fuels. So we figured out solar energy or nuclear power quickly and humanity developed civilization without any fossil fuels. But let's say we had some big volcano somewhere that started releasing CO2 with exactly the curve of current CO2 emissions. And, and we even had predictions of what that volcano would do from the volcanologist and it was just like RCP uh, 8.5. So you could have all the same IPCC report with all the same climate uncertainties and all the same climate impacts. It's just that it wouldn't be due to people. But everything else would still be bad. In that world, if you found solar geoengineering, I think you'd say, this is fantastic. This is very likely to reduce the risks a lot. And of course, it has some side effects. Any cure has some side effects, but we should get on it. And you've got to think hard about why you're not saying that. Because remember, the CO2 that is already in the air, it was caused by your parents or other people, but in any case, it's the past. In decision theory, things that are already done are done. The CO2 is in the air. Our decisions can change how much more CO2 we put in the air. But our decisions about putting more CO2 in the air don't change what's the current risk. If you want to deal with the CO2 in the air, you either have to take it out of the air or do solar geoengineering, those are the only two choices. Yeah, just uh, a thought. If geoengineering works, then people will be less incentivized to reduce their carbon footprint if it works. Because if it's anyway working, why to yeah. reduce carbon footprint? Yeah. Yeah. If it doesn't work, then we don't know. I mean, there could be other types of risks. So, which is better essentially? And do we have some framework of this? So, that's called risk. There's two, let me, there's two different ideas there. Let me show one other plot about, uh, about risk risk trade off that maybe, uh, hold on, I'm going to go back to the other slides. Um, uh, so here's a simple way to think about the, the biases and concerns. So one way to think about it is a two by two matrix. This is actually from a paper where we calculate the value of information, and we do this actually as n by n with an integrated assessment model. Let's just do this two by two. So this is, let's say, our expectations, our beliefs, and this is reality. Obviously, the real world isn't that simple, but it's a useful way to think about it. So either we think solar geoengineering works, or we think it doesn't work, and then we find that actually works or it doesn't work. So obviously, you know, everybody's happy if, if correct, predictions are correct. But what almost everybody is thinking about when they're worried about solar geoengineering is they're thinking about this box, okay? They're thinking about, the concern, underlying concern of several of your comments is to say, well, what if we think it works? Oops, sorry. Uh, what if we think it works and we find out that it doesn't? So like we think it works and then we maybe don't reduce CO2 emissions as quickly as we should have and then we find we can't use it or there's too many risks. That is absolutely right. We should be worrying about that. But don't forget about the other box. It's symmetric. Don't forget about this box. Because another mistake would be if we look back in 2070 and say, man, prejudice kept us from doing this. If we had done it, we could have reduced sea level rise, we could have saved tens of millions of people, we could have saved ecosystems, but we didn't because we were prejudiced. Both those errors matter. There's no risk-free choice. Yep. But first part of my question is about... Yeah, it was slightly different. It was about risk compensation. So, so, so they're, they're related questions. This is about perception. So I think your question was a risk compensation question. Like, what, what if it means that we cut emissions less? So, yeah. so this happens all the time. Lesser, lesser and lesser incentive to cut emissions. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. Maybe enhance the rate at which we are burning. So. Maybe, but this happens all the time in public policy. So there's a couple different answers. Um, you can also get the opposite effect which is that it accelerates emissions cuts because it makes people feel that they can solve the problem. Um, uh, here's an interesting fact. If you ask random humans, you take a group of humans, you 
tell half of them about solar geoengineering and not the other half, and then you tell them some climate risk, and then you ask them how much they care about cutting emissions, which group do you think is, wants more to cut emissions? Th those who have been told about solar geo. And that experiment's repeated several times, and we keep getting the same answer. It's quite robust. Um, so, but I want to get you think about risk compensation. So, so let's say solar geoengineering works pretty well, and we cut emissions a little more slowly. That might still be a better world than we're in now. But scenario doesn't. Yeah. Right. But the underlying worry is risk is, is risk compensation. But it is always true that different policies fight against each other or compensate for each other. So remember, the argument that you're implicitly making is the same argument as people used to make about any work on adaptation. So Al Gore, for example, used to say we should do no effort on adaptation. Many of the climate thinkers said we should not allow people in, say, India to figure out how to protect themselves from heat because that will take the attention away from emissions cuts. I think in hindsight that was what well, was wrong empirically in that now, that was 20 years ago, we spend much more effort on emissions cuts and more effort on adaptation. But I also think it was morally wrong because it's morally wrong to tell people they shouldn't protect themselves. And that is in fact what many of the climate elite were saying 20 years ago. And I think the same is going to be true with solar geoengineering. I think these, these attitudes shift. Um, there are, of course, compensations between emissions cuts and solar geo adaptation. But that doesn't mean the fact that if you do more adaptation more effectively, then you might do a little less emissions cuts doesn't mean that adaptation is bad. And, and these things often fit together in complicated ways. Yeah. Is much, it's going back to this idea that we need more research. Yeah. You know, academics and then yeah. Go and do that. So, can you say one or two critical questions that we really need to answer? Right yeah, now? I'll actually show some. I could show some slides. How much longer? Yeah. So, let me get because some, some of that may be more detailed. detailed. Let me get another question or two. That's a that's a great question, but I think I'm going to skip it for a second. Maybe anybody else who hasn't asked a question. New customers? All right, I get one repeat customer. So how do you compare like, for example, the PCS and PDA technologies, which are more costlier than solar geoengineering, but they don't have any mortality effects? Uh, I think that's deeply incorrect. So I can say that even though I stand to make money out of carbon removal, when I calculate what is the mortality effects of carbon removal um, versus solar geoengineering, to achieve the same marginal temperature reduction in 2050, I actually find the mortality effects of CDR are 100 times bigger. So I think there's just a lot of prejudice here. I think what you're saying is what you think, not based on analysis. So if you actually do the analysis, if you spend the kind of money it would take to do carbon removal, and you calculate with a life cycle assessment what that means in terms of PM mortality or workplace mortality, it's huge. So I've actually done that SRM versus CDR calculation. Pardon? That paper isn't published yet because I think it'll piss people off too much, but I think it's correct. It's a pretty easy calculation to do. Yeah, I think people, I think people are incredibly naive about what the impacts of these big things are. So you're saying there's no mortality impact from, from large-scale CDR? How can you say that? I mean, if you just go into an economic life cycle analysis, if you spend the trillion dollars a year on heavy construction, you're going to have particulate matter, you're going to have uh, 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 mobilized metals, you're going to damage land, you're going to kill people. And you can go look at, you can look up a LCA and see how many people it is. And it turns out to be more than the equivalent benefit from SRM for what I said. And not a little bit more, like 100 times more. Yeah, I think people are just not realistic. You've got to actually look at the numbers. Of course, if, if you could cost-free just remove CO2 to the atmosphere, of course, you'd never bother with solar geoengineering. But the answer is it's not cost-free to take CO2 to the atmosphere. It's a huge cost. And that means we're not spending the money on something else, like education or healthcare. Money is not infinite. Any more? So you look at sulfur, you see 
Yep. Yeah. So, so we've actually, my group has worked on that a lot. It's one of the main little technical things I've done. So um, we've looked at, uh, one thing we've looked at is calcite, basically limestone. And that turns out to be better for two reasons. One reason is that it um, doesn't absorb in the, uh, sulfate absorbs some uh, near-infrared light, which means you get the stratospheric heating with sulfate. You don't get that with calcite. And the other thing is calcite's a base, and it reacts with the uh, chlorine and sulfur acid, and it tends to actually restore ozone. So we published a paper in PNS so you could simultaneously restore ozone and, uh, um, and cool the planet. So that's calcite. And... Um, If, if it's the same amount of scattering, it's the same temperature effect, yeah. Um, and we've also looked at diamond, and it might, you might say, oh, that's crazy. But you can actually buy half micron diamonds now from China in 10 kilo bags. They're not that expensive. And I, at one of the research topics I like to do is actually start to work with some of these diamond manufacturers to say, like, what would it mean to have, like, a thousand tons or ten thousand tons a year. I don't really know how expensive it is. It's not clear that it's that expensive. And diamond has the advantage that it's very high index and it has no infrared absorption and it's pretty inert. So I don't think it's completely crazy. We've looked at uh, some other things, alumina as well. Yeah, I think, but to come back to the big question, maybe, and then I'll close. I think, um, um, I, I think that. It, it, it's actually quite hard to think cleanly about whether or not these ideas might be useful. And on the one hand, they look very far away. And on the other hand, climate risks are real. And some governments might decide to actually do this to reduce risks pretty quickly. And I think you just don't know what's going to happen. My view is it's worth doing the research because we really don't know what's going to happen. But I do think it's important to keep coming back to this fact that we have a risk-to-risk -risk choice, that it's, there's no risk-free choice here, and that it might well make sense not to do geoengineering because uh, of all the uncertainties. But, but remember, you're then suffering the uncertainties of the hot climate. And, and so thinking about the trade-off is, is hard and different. But when you think about the trade-off, you're not allowed to just say, oh, I'm going to ignore solar geoengineering because it's kind of uncertain. Because, of course, you have to think about the counterfactual. So, happy to get more questions and comments. Yep. Um, so the response time. I'm going to actually try and pull up one other slide uh, for this other gentleman's question. Um, well, the response time. Not a simple answer. Um, for putting sulfates in the stratosphere, or anything in the stratosphere, it takes about a year for them to mix evenly. And the lifetime is about two years. So in the stratosphere, you've got this kind of two-year time filter, if you like, or a year and a half. Um, for marine cloud brightening or cirrus thinning, it's basically hours, instantaneous. And the cooling effect can be instantaneous. I mean, you know when a thin cloud comes over on a hot day, it cools down right away. So you want to really figure out kind of what you're asking. There's no single time scale. Um, um, more, more and more question, if you like. I'm gonna I'm trying to look up uh, stuff on research prioritization. Um, yep. Yep. Of solar, what's the word? What about solar aircraft? Just by the aircraft reflecting, uh, it not yeah. Um, you're just not enough surface area, um, not even close. Um, um, here, I'll get this uh, there. Um, um, yeah. You're thinking that just having aircraft up there, the aircraft would be shiny and reflect sunlight? Yeah, I think uh, you need a sense of the scale. So we're talking about increasing the reflectivity of the Earth by 
which is like making 1% of the surface area be perfectly reflective. And that that's dwarfs what you could ever do with aircraft. Like that's making all cities perfectly reflective. Um, so yeah, just to kind of come back to you, you asked the question about like what, what's researchable. So I'll just show you some examples. Like this is a, 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 a big matrix of stuff underneath. So there's a whole lot of individual pathways that you could do research, like looking at reaction rates on individual aerosols or uh, um, looking at tracers for diagnosing the stratospheric circulation or doing these passive long duration balloons to measure uh, chemistry. There's a, a, a huge, this is just sort of the beginning, and a bunch of those things have a list of things underneath them. So there's a, a big sweep of researchable ideas. Yeah, well, so these are all about improving the predictions. Yeah, there's an, another set for understanding deployment. I've got a, a big set of these things. All right. Anand, you get the last question. Yeah? Yeah. 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 So, 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 I think, yeah. So, if you're thinking SRM versus CDR, I think one thing to think about is again that they look completely different depending on time scale. So the point is, when you with with CDR, you spend a lot of money to build a CDR device, whatever it is, whether it's a, a forest or a machine it takes you to. That's you spent the capital, you spent all this capital to do it. The day that you have built the device, you got no benefit. The benefit comes as it's used over time, and then that benefit comes slowly through the climate cycle. But the benefit grows with time. So with CDR, the benefits are more and more as you go far in the future. With SRM, it's the opposite. You get this instantaneous benefit and harms but you have no future benefit. So they're really different. And I think the, the trade-off between them depends on when it is. So I was answering somebody else's question, your question, saying it, 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 the way to do it is you can, you can calculate what are the side effects or impacts to produce this, a given tiny amount of cooling at a, some time in the future. And the ratio depends completely on the time. So if you go very far in the future, CDR looks way better than SRM. But if you go just like, 50 years or 20 years in the future, very short, SRM looks way better than CDR. So it depends on the time. They're just doing different things. Uh, and in terms of the politics, so I think what you're saying in that is essentially CDR is politically easier because it doesn't require such coordination. I think, I'm not sure I believe that. And I think, uh, I think in the answer is CDR does require coordination at the scale at which it would be meaningful. So if you're talking about the kind of stuff that's in the modern integrated assessment models, like 10 gigatons a year of CDR. So if that was really true and we're sort of at current cost, that's like several trillion dollars of money which is not going to any productive use just to take the CO2 out of the atmosphere. That's several percent of the world's economy. That's not going to get done just for fun. There's going to be, that's going to be, that's creating industries bigger than the current energy industry. That's going to have huge implications for employment and economy. And, and I think there was going to be big political fights about that. And I think in practice, that's not, it only looks easy when you're talking about very small amounts of it. I think if you're talking about large amounts of it, you're right, it's different. There's some way in which it requires coordination in a different way. But it requires the coordination of actually spending all that money to reduce emissions, which is hard. Because it's in nobody's self-interest to do it. But I agree, SRM has a different set of problems. So I, I'm not saying one is easier, I'm just saying it's hard to compare. All right? Call it? Yeah. Okay. So if we have no more questions, then please close. Thank you for listening. <laughs>